I'm going to be doing my talk in English. I hope everybody knows that. Um, I do speak Russian, so if you have questions that it's easier for you to ask in Russian, you're welcome to do so, and I will try my best to answer them. Uh, my technical jargon in Russian is very limited, so keep that in mind. Um, so, as was just stated, this talk is called Becoming a SQL Guru, and I'm going to go through some advanced SQL functionality that Postgres has. Uh, before that, so I work for a company called Yellow. We are a SaaS company and in the talent recruitment sphere, and our goal is to eliminate the gaps in the hiring experience. We do this through a client-first culture, through technological advancement, and through knowing the market really, really well. That's all I'm going to say about my company. Okay, the agenda. We'll do a really quick review of the syntax. Then I'm going to do a quick review of join types. As I go through this, raise your hand if you think you're familiar with this concept. So who knows the different join types in Postgres? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, set operators. Raise your hand. Okay. Filtered aggregates. Okay. Grouping sets. Okay. Subqueries. Okay. Window functions. CTEs. Lateral, oh, a lot less, okay. <laughs> and then we'll have time for questions. Also, as I go through this, if you have questions throughout, please stop me and ask questions. By the time we get to the end, you are going to forget your questions. Um, so stop me, I would much rather have you understand everything that we actually go through than get through everything and have you walk out not knowing what you learned. So a lot of times when people first learn SQL. They think, oh, like, what is the SQL syntax? We have a select statement from some kind of table, where some condition, maybe an order by. As we little learn a little bit more, we think, oh, we can join multiple different tables together. Then maybe we learn how to do aggregations and doing a group by and having clause. But in reality, if you look at the Postgres documentation, the syntax looks like this and then it continues, and then it continues some more. So it's actually quite complex and has a lot of functionality that a lot of people just don't know that is there and don't use often. So I'm gonna go through this one pretty quickly to save time for the most complex topics. Um, I think most people here are familiar with inner joins, outer joins, and the one that I think less people are familiar with is a cross join. How many people here have used a cross-join before? How many of you used it intentionally? Okay. Um, so essentially, a cross-join creates a Cartesian product of two different tables. What does that mean? Let's say we start out with two different tables. We have a stores table and a products table. And I want to know every single combination of inventory possible for every single store. So I might write select star from stores, cross join products. In the older syntax, it would be written like this. Um, that's why a lot of people used to do cross joins accidentally. Hopefully we don't do that now. Um, the result will look something like this. So we'll see that we have coffee and tea for our Chicago location and coffee and tea for our Dallas location. Any questions? Cool. So obviously keep in mind, there are very limited use cases where you would want to utilize this cross join because if it creates a Cartesian product of your tables and you have very large tables, your data set is gonna explode exponentially. So set operators. I'm gonna ask you to memorize these tables. They're gonna be used over and over in my presentation. Um, so let's say we have a customer's table that has a unique ID, customer name, city, postal code, and country. And then we have a supplier's table with an ID, a supplier name, city, postal code, country, and revenue for that supplier. So what are set operators? We'll start with union. Let's say I want to get a list of all cities that are either in my customer table or in my supplier table. I can do select city from customers, union all, select city from suppliers, 
and I'll get this full list. Notice if you do union all, duplicate records will be retained. So we had a customer in Chicago as well as a supplier, so we see Chicago twice on the list. If I want to remove duplication, I simply change this to a union, and now we see that Chicago appears only once. Any questions? So similar, we have accept and intercept. If we want to get all of the cities that exist in our customers table, but exclude just the cities in our supplier table, we can do this with an accept criteria. Or if we only want the intersection of the data from both tables, we use intersect. Questions? Cool. Um, filtered aggregates. So this was always technically possible through case statements, but it's really inefficient. So let's say in my example, I get the total revenue for my suppliers, but I also want a separate column for total revenue just for the US. So in this case, I have sum, and then a sum case when the country is USA, then take the revenue, otherwise use zero. And so I can write this and it'll run just fine. In 9.4, this became much easier to read, particularly if you have a lot of these. Now we can clarify this filter keyword and just put a where statement within the metric itself. Yeah? I'm not positive. I think it's mostly syntax sugar, honestly. Um, I haven't seen too much performance implications. I suspect that on the back end, it probably does something similar to the case statement. Um, like in the optimizer, it probably does the same kind of functionality. But for a human readable perspective, it's a lot better, right? It makes your queries a lot cleaner. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, no, Postgres, I mean, they intentionally, most of the features that they built in, they made sure that they're optimized, right? So a lot of the stuff in here that there are other ways to do it, the other ways are usually less efficient or the same efficiency. Sorry, I'm getting pop-ups on my screen. Um, any other questions? Okay, grouping sets. So grouping sets are new to Postgres 9.5. So if you're not on 9.5, you should be, they're great. Um, grouping sets allow you essentially to do group buys, but rather than having a group by that grows across all of your attributes within your query, it allows you to create sets and in a single operation do a group by for each of those sets individually. There are also a couple shortcuts. So to build a hierarchy of sets, you can use a keyword of rollup. And to create a multi-directional, non-hierarchical grouping set, you can use a cube. And we'll go through examples of each of these. So in addition to our customers table and our suppliers table, now we have an orders table. So in this orders table, we can see that we have a reference to our customer ID, our supplier ID, a date, and the amount of the order. So let's say I want to start out by getting a sum and an average of all orders, as well as the count of orders, and I want to split this by the supplier country, the name, the order month, and the customer name. So I would write something like this. I have my group by for each of those attributes. Um, note just for reference, I converted the date into a month so that it would be neater in the output, and we get something like this basic group by. But now, let's say I want to get subtotals for each of my attributes individually, not across all of them. So I want to get uh, an, all of the averages and counts and sums for my suppliers, then for the month, then for my customer name, and then across all attributes, right? So this little last one with the parentheses, is means just go across the entire set. So now we have something like this. We have our aggregations just by the supplier name, 
just by the customer name, just by the month, and across everything. What's the problem with this result set? Anybody? Say that again? Too many nulls, exactly. So the problem with nulls is you have no idea if it's a null because it's aggregating across that set or if it's a null because your data actually contains nulls. So we obviously don't want to provide reporting in this manner. How do we fix it? So there's this grouping operator. So in my case, I'm gonna do a case statement and say when the grouping for my supplier name is equal to zero, then I wanna leave the supplier name. Otherwise, I wanna replace it with some standard text. In my case, I chose all suppliers, and I did the same exact thing for all the other attributes in my set. So now I get something like this. For our initial grouping, we see the supplier name, and for month and customer name, it says all customers and all months. Same thing for customers, we get the customer name, all suppliers, all months. Specific months, all suppliers and all customers, and then across the entire set. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Okay. Now, let's say I want to build out a hierarchy, right? So in my case, I want to build a hierarchy that says I want a grouping by country supplier name and customer name. Oh, turn it really quick. And then I want one that just goes by country and supplier, then just by country, and then across the entire set. And in this case, I'm also putting a filter because I don't want too many rows in my output because I don't have enough space. Um, so in this case, I'm limiting it to the US and Spain countries for our suppliers. So now we get something like this. We have our most granular uh, group by, which includes the detail level for all of our attributes. Then we move up one layer where we aggregate across all customers, but retain supplier country and supplier name. Then we go out to the uh, supplier country, and then one more layer to include all of our attributes. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Now, you could do this using just the grouping sets without the keyword rollup, and it'll look like this. So rather than writing out all of this text, you can just say rollup. Also, these slides are gonna be posted online so you don't need to take photos. Um, yeah. So cube is similar to rollup, but rather than going in a one directional hierarchy, it actually goes in every single direction possible within your set of attributes. So in this case, I limited my options to just have the supplier name and the customer name, again, for the sake of space and I also limited it to two specific uh, customer IDs. So now we get something like this. We have our most granular level that includes the supplier name and the customer name. Then we go in one direction where we aggregate across customers to the supplier. Then we go in the other direction where we aggregate by customer across suppliers, and then we go across them both. Does that make sense? Any questions? And again, that one can also be rewritten through the manual grouping sets, but you probably don't want to. Um, okay, subqueries. I think most people raised their hand and said they were pretty familiar with subqueries, um, so I won't spend too much time on it. But essentially, we have two different types of queries. I'm gonna start with uncorrelated subqueries. Uncorrelated subquery usually calculates a constant result set for your query, and it executes it only one time. So as an example, we might want to select the supplier name and the city from our suppliers table where the country is in select country from customers. So I want only the suppliers that have potential for local customers. And we get something like this. I can also do a correlated subquery. Correlated subquery references other variables within your upper or outer query. So this means that it has to get re-executed for every single row within your outer query. 
And oftentimes, but not always, it can be rewritten in some kind of joint fashion. So as an example, let's say I want my supplier name and country, and then I want to do a distinct count of customers where the customer country is equal to the supplier country. Right, so I'm referencing within my subquery, I'm referencing the outer query. And we get something like this. Any questions on this? It's pretty straightforward. Cool. So window functions is the one that most people have trouble with. It seemed like a lot of people raised their hand. So I'm not sure to what level you guys are familiar with them. Um, but essentially, a window function performs a calculation across, across a set of rows that are in some way related to the current row. Essentially, what it allows you to do is reference other rows within your table, but still retain row level detail for your output. And we're gonna go through some examples, but first, this is what the syntax looks like. It's very complex when you glance at it at first, but the core uh, outline of it is that you have some kind of aggregation function over and then some kind of window frame. So we have an optional frame clause, which can be range or rows, which we'll get into in a few slides. And we can have a start for your frame clause and an end. Start can be anything from unbounded proceeding, which means that you start at the very beginning of your partition. Value proceeding, which means that you specify a certain number of rows prior to the current row where you want to begin. Or the current row, which means that you start with the current row. For your end clause, you have unbounded following, which means that you go to the very end of your partition. Value following, a certain number of rows past the current row or the current row, which is the default. So as a general rule, if you don't have a frame clause specified, it will default to range unbounded proceeding. So let's look at a basic example. Um, let's say I want to get uh, the supplier name, the country, and the revenue, but then I want the average revenue for only suppliers that have the same country as the current row. So I'm gonna say, average revenue over partition by country. And we're gonna get something like this. So we can see that for Canada, which only has a single supplier, the average is the same as the revenue. The same goes for Spain. But now for the US, we see that Herpeticulture LLC actually has a higher revenue than the average revenue for other suppliers within the US, while Goose Island Beer, unfortunately, has a lower revenue. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Cool. Okay, so what's the difference between range and rows? This can get complicated if you don't use it often. Range treats all members of a particular group in a single instance and calculates your uh, metric across all of them and provides the same value. So what does that mean? So in this case, notice I removed the partition because now I want to do a running average, right? So I removed my partition and I just said, give me the average revenue ordered by country, range unbounded proceeding. So we see that as we go through, the first average is just for that first row, the second one includes the first rows, and the next one includes all four rows because when you order by country, both of the records that have USA are treated simultaneously in the same run and therefore have the same exact value. Okay? Now, if we do the same exact query but change this to be rows unbounded proceeding, we see something different. So the first two are the same, but now the first row that has USA in it is treated independently of the second row and we get different running averages and it actually runs for every single row. Does that make sense to everybody? Questions? Cool. So, what is a window clause? Oftentimes, if you're using window functions, you're gonna have multiple different window functions that run over the same kind of 
clause. You want to partition by the same thing, you want to order by the same thing, but you need to do it for three or four different metrics. So in my case, let's say I want to get both the sum of revenue as well as the average revenue. So rather than specifying my over clause multiple times and having to copy and paste it, I can specify it once at the very end and give it a name. So in my case, I was very creative and I called it my window. And now within my actual over clause, I simply reference my window and we get these results. And you can do this with multiple different window clauses as well, if you have, let's say, two or three different variations. Again, this is more like syntax sugar, if you will, not actual functionality. Now I'm gonna go through just a couple actual analytical functions that, ha that are window functions. Because in theory, the examples that I've been providing so far are just regular aggregation functions that you could use without window functions but there are also some functions that are specific just to window functions. So row number is one of them. So let's say I have my um, sum of revenue and average revenue for my supplier name, country, and revenue, but I also want to label all of my rows and just give them a numeric count. So I would use row number, I have nothing in my over clause, I don't want to partition, I don't want to order by anything, and I get something like this. So we see that we have row one, two, three, and four. Now, I've seen a lot of people use rank in the same way that they use rows. Don't. They're very different, um, and it causes problems if you think they're not. So a rank actually ranks all of your data. That means that whatever you specify as your order by, if there are rows that have the same exact value, they're gonna have the same rank. So in our case, we can see that the US both of the rows in US actually get the same exact ranking. And then after that, the ranking drops to three and four. Does that make sense? Nod if you understood what I said. Okay. Um, for reference, because I've gotten this question before, you could add an order by to your overall query and it will not affect the output of the order by within your window clause. So for example, I kept my rank as ordered by country descending, but I want to order my overall result set by the supplier name. So we can see that the same two rows still have a ranking of one, even though they don't show up at the top of the list. So this is just a quick list of the specific analytical functions that exist in Postgres. I'm not going to go through the rest of these due to time constraints, but I would highly suggest that you take a look at what they are. Um, just knowing that they exist can be really useful when you come upon some kind of problem, and then you can always look up the specific syntax later on. Okay, so CTEs, also known as common table expressions, and in Postgres, a lot of times people just refer to it as the with clause. Um, it essentially allows you to write a subquery that gets cached almost like a temporary table within your result set and can be then referenced throughout your result, throughout your other parts of your query. Um, there are recursive or self-referencing CTEs, which we'll go through, but we will first start with a regular non-recursive CTE. Um, one thing everybody should be aware of is that in Postgres, at least right now, uh, CTEs count as an optimization fence. So that means that when your optimizer looks at your overall query, it looks at just your CTE and figures out how to optimize it without seeing the rest of your query. So this is great if you know this and you can write your query to be optimized better. If you're not aware of this, you could create a really inefficient query. So just be careful with that. Um, so the basic syntax of a CTE is we have with clause, give your CTE a name. In my case, I did CTEC, and then specify what it is. So I have my subquery of selecting a country and account distinct of customers from our customers table. Then I have another CTE for, that does the exact same thing, but for suppliers. And then I want to join the two CTEs based on the country. And so I'll get something like this. Any questions on this 
basic example. So recursive examples are a little bit more complex. So I'm going to start with a simple example. Let's say I want to get a list of all numbers from 1 to 100. How do I do that? So I specify with recursive, so this is kind of the keyword, my CT name. I start out with a non-recursive term. In my case, I just start with a value of 1 because I want 1 through 100. I'm then going to union with some kind of self-reference. So in my case, I want to do select n plus 1 from my CT name for as long as n is less than 100. And then I'm going to select from my overall CT. So what this does is it basically iterates through for as long as my where clause is valid. Any questions on this? Cool. So how does it actually work in detail? We can think of this as having three different buckets or three different folders. So we start out with our non-recursive term. As long as we're union, using union all, we will keep duplicates. As long as we're using union, we discard any duplicate rows. We then take what's left from our non-recursive term and put it into the recursive query results bucket and also into a temporary working table then as long as there's something that's in our working table, we cycle through these two steps. We go through and we evaluate the recursive term where we substitute the content of the working table for the self-reference. We again remove duplication if we're using union, and then we take the output of that and put it into an intermediary table as well as the results table, or the results folder, let's say. We then replace our working table contents with the intermediate table contents and clear the intermediate table. And we keep going until it's done. So what does that look like in practice? Let's say we have a table of parts that has some kind of car parts in it. In our case, we have a car, a cylinder head, a door, an engine, a wheel, and then it has some kind of component of that larger part and how many of the components are within the larger part. And let's say your mechanics want to know, oh, we need to figure out our inventory and we need to know how many screws is it going to take to assemble a full car. So you could do that by doing left outer joins and just doing however many you think you might need, which is obviously very inefficient because you don't know how many cycles you need. Or you can do it through a recursive CTE. So we're going to start out with, we're going to have with recursive, our CT is called list. We're going to have the whole, the part, and the count. We start by calculating our non-recursive query. So in this case, I said, let's select the whole, the part, and the count from our parts table, but only where the whole is equal to a car, because that's what we care about. Then we have our recursive self-reference. So in my case, I'm referencing our initial CTE joining it back to the original parts table such that the whole of the part is equal to the part of our CTE self-reference. I'm pulling in the whole from the CTE so that it always shows the car, the part from the parts table, and I'm multiplying the two counts. So what this is going to do is it's going to evaluate this. It's going to substitute the working table contents of our initial non-recursive term for this self-reference. It's going to take the output and put it into both the intermediary table, the working table, and append the results table. And it's going to keep going and emptying the intermediate table until our working table has nothing in it. And then I just want to do a select sum the of the count from our CT where the part is equal to a screw. And that's going to give us 34. Are there any questions on that? Did the logic make sense? OK. Um, one of the cool things about writable CT or about CTs is that they can also be writable. Um, so let's say I want to delete some information from a particular table, and then I want to write that into a different table. So in my case, let's say I want to archive some particular rows and keep it in an archive table. So in my case, 
I have delete from the parts table where the whole is equal to a car, returning everything. And then I'm going to do an insert into the parts archive and select star from our archive rows. Does that make sense? Cool. We can also do recursive writable CTEs. So in this case, let's say we have basically the same CTE that we started with, but now what I really want to do is just create a new table. Right? I want my mechanics to be able to look at a table that says, for the car, here are all the parts and how many of them you need. So I can do something like this, run the initial CTE, and then insert it into a car parts list, and then select from this CTE. And that'll give me something like this. So this is the output of that original CTE. Are there any questions on that? Cool. OK, lateral. Um, so lateral came out in Postgres 9.3. It seemed like a lot less people raised their hand for this one at the beginning. Um, so what lateral allows you to do is it allows you to reference another subquery or another part of your from statement within a subquery that's in your from clause. It's kind of like a correlated subquery, which Postgres doesn't naturally allow you to do within your from clause. So when it comes to set returning functions, this keyword is actually implicit, so you don't have to specify it. But in normal queries, you do. So we'll look at an example of each. So let's say we have a set returning function. I want to start out by creating a table that has a list of numbers from 1 to 10. So I'm going to do select generate series and from generate series from 1 to 10. Then I want to create a second table where I want to produce an output that pulls in the original list of 10 IDs and uses each of them within the set returning function to generate a series and uses that number as the maximum number. So I can select from numbers, lateral join my generate series from one, but this time using the max number from the numbers table as the ending. And I can also do this the same way without specifying this lateral. And we'll get something like this. Right, so obviously this isn't the full output, but we have one, one, then for two, we have one and two. For three, we have one, two, three. And it'll continue on and on. Are there any questions on this? Kay. Now, let's say I want to do something like this. So I start out where I want to say that I want some information using a subquery where I select only my customers from my customer list where their name starts with an S. And then I want to join suppliers, but only the suppliers who are in the same country as my customers from this subquery. If I try to run this, I get this error in Postgres. Right? It says error invalid reference to from clause entry for table C. And then it seems to imply that it knows that I have a table C, but it just can't reference it. So it's kind of annoying, because you're like, but you see it. Why can't you just use it? You obviously know it's there. But if I change this to have this one keyword, all of a sudden, everything works fine, and it's successful. Are there any questions on this? OK. Um, so this is the example of the output from that lateral join. Now, there are other ways to do this, right? So for example, at a company that I worked at, um, the way that we accomplished this, because we didn't have lateral at the time, we were on Postgres 8.3 or 8.4, I believe, we did this a lot. So we essentially had a correlated subquery within the criteria of our join. So we constantly had things that would say left outer join something, where the ID is equal to the maximum of that ID joined like where the customer is equal to the outer customer, so on and so forth. This was really hard to read, and not only that, but it was a lot less efficient. Right? So when it comes to lateral, it really is more efficient in a lot of cases. There are some cases where it's on par, 
but there are some cases where it's just so much more optimized. And frankly, this looks really bad. Any questions about any of the things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, like for instance, I do BI. So, for everybody else, the question was, what's the real life application for grouping sets? Why would you actually need to utilize it? Um, so, I work in BI, and I constantly have to do reporting for like finance departments, marketing departments, all sorts of departments, right, on the business side. And it's very common that if they have some kind of funnel that they care about, Right, let's say they have a marketing funnel, or let's say that they have, um, I don't know, any other, like a customer acquisition funnel, right? So it'll say, for instance, oh, um, our outer level is organic versus non-organic customers, right? Then within organic, they might have multiple categories. Somebody that came in through email campaigns, somebody else that came in through a referral, somebody else that came in through a TV campaign. Same thing for non-organic. They have some kind of breakdown of general outside marketing that they do. Then for each of those categories, they have additional breakdowns, right? For their email campaign, they might have the holiday campaign, the spring campaign, whatever it might be. And so what they ask me for is they say, okay, I want to see the detailed level, but then I want to see the subtotals for each of my new categories. Yeah, so to do it without grouping sets, you would basically have to go in and write a bunch of separate queries and then union them all together, which nobody wants to do. Does that make sense? Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> you <laughs> this is why you have to be careful with recursive CTEs. So yes, for example, if I, in my example that I did, yeah. So if I had done this example and had omitted this where clause, it would just keep going and going and going until a DBA killed it or it ran out of CPU, or it ran out of something, right? It would, eventually it might die, but it'll probably take days or weeks before this thing dies. Um, so you do have to be careful, right? If you're doing something that has the potential to keep going indefinitely, you definitely need to add some kind of limit. Um, in the other example that I gave, there's a natural limit by virtue of the fact that I'm joining. Right, so in my case where I was joining to another table, because the working table at some point would become empty because there's nothing left to join to, it naturally stops. Any other questions? Cool, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>